As promised, we now continue with another 2013 Burning Man talk by yours truly, Dr. Bruce. Wheel your bike with me across the playa to the spectacular dome at Fractal Planet, a camp centered around visionary art and led by the eclectic crew of spectacular visionary artist Andrew, a.k.a. Android, Jones. Android and a large spirited audience gave me all the juice I needed to resonate out a vision for how we monkeys might use our fully activated minds to reimagine and then to remake our world. Is this even plausible or possible? Try it in your own life and see for yourself, for the universe is a mighty big probability engine that is just waiting for you to plug in your vision. Next up, we have Dr. Bruce Damer, who's going to be presenting Lighting Up a Path for the Ascension of the Monkeys, imagining a wonderfully reinvented human civilization. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Bruce. Thank you, thank you. I had the incredible honor and pleasure of having Andrew and Andrew, Andrew Squared, as my neighbors for three years in Boulder Creek, California, and it was just a thrill to be able to go over and catch that energy and see that great big printer in the hallway and see Andrew's van around Boulder Creek. What an amazing thing to have in your neighborhood. And they're back in Colorado now, but uh, the psychedelic shire, as we like to call the Santa Cruz Mountains, was blessed by that elvish crew that was there for us for so long. Andrew's talk was about personal power and, and creativity and realizing those dreams. And my talk's a good segue because it's about realizing the dreams of all of us, of all of humanity. How many of you have done the practice where you like think, I want to create this great piece of art, and you see it in your head? You, you see the reality of it, you see the paint on the canvas and you see how you've mastered the, the skill of doing it and you studied the masters and you just have it so damn clear in your head how many of you kind of get those flashes of desire and of creativity where you see it in advance over here over here over here so if you wanted to become a great stage magician sleight of hand if you wanted to write an app that you sold to Facebook for a billion dollars or something like that. I think all of these things start with an imaginative flash. You know, here in the so-called psychedelic visionary community, we have something we call a flash. And that flash is where the total neuronal body of your brain, of your fruiting body of your mind is turned on all at once in some great revelation. You know, you saw the face of God, you had the greatest orgasm of your life, or you had a dream, a personal dream. And I think at those points, the flash occurs. And the flash, I think, is totally precious and unique to us monkeys. Because here's a secret for you. Did you know that when the flash occurs in your mind, do you know how that works? Think of your neuronal bundle as like the Los Angeles freeway system. The LA freeway system is good because it's a tangled mess, right? Things go across one another. All the cars are moving along are electrons moving down sodium channels. They bump around in the neurons. When you have a flash like that, it's like a Richter scale 8.5 or 9 earthquake that rocks the city. Say it's 1972 and everyone's driving a Volkswagen Beetle, right? Good old days, right? When you're rocked by an earthquake, this happened to a friend of mine on the Bay Bridge which collapsed in front of her. Her stick shift went into neutral. It's like, she, she was cursing the mechanic saying, God damn it, that guy didn't screw the engine back in. You know, and the engine's vibrating out of my car, but it was the whole of the land. The earth was vibrating under her car. Her car went into neutral. She was trying to step on her gas to go forward or back, and no, the car wouldn't do anything. And then a section of Bay Bridge came down right in front of her, bam. And she said, oh my God, if I'd been in drive, I'd be a pancake right now. 
So imagine this happening to the whole Los Angeles freeway system. All the cars pop into neutral. The drivers are still sort of rolling along, but truthfully, the car probabilistically could go anywhere. And this is what happens to your brain on the flash. There's something called gray goo that goes between the neurons. Guess what that's filled with? Little quantum dynamical tunnels. Little quantum dynamical tunnels. We don't even know what they're for, but they sort of route meta information through. It could be the explanation for everything. But when those electrons are slammed into neutral and they're going down that freeway, and they're going up. Guess what happens? It's a quantum dynamical system. Something happens called the blooming of Feynman histories. Suddenly, that electron, it could go anywhere. It could go across the gray goo. It could go back up the, the neuron. It could kind of do anything it wants. That's the flash. It's instant, and it's total, and it happens. Then what happens is the collapse, the collapse of those histories. Those histories are potential pathways. Did any of you do the two-slit experiment in high school? We have light beaming at two slits, and instead of just like two dots there or one dot or 15 dots, you see this wave pattern. That's one of the great experiments in science that showed that photons are actually particles and waves at the same time. Well, electrons are too. So think of the flash as the giant two-slit experiment on you. So it happens, you get this wave that goes through your whole head. Then the true magic happens, and it's an accident of the basic physics of the universe. There's a collapse of those histories, but it's symmetrical. That means when the histories collapse down and it says, you know what, your Honda, your Volkswagen Beetle is still gonna go down the freeway toward the off-ramp in Santa Monica, but Guess what? Because of the collapse of the histories around the neuron, it has a symmetrical probability of going into reverse, backing up, and going all the way back down to downtown LA. That's what happens in the post-flash. That is something that is incredible and magical. How many of you have, in that state, seen the face of God, what you felt deeply was the face of God at that point? Anybody? Face of God? Uh, the Ineffable? Anyone seen an Mr. or Mrs. Ineffable? Uh, have you seen an enormous landscape that was so huge, made out of so many parts that you said, how can I be even imaging this in my head? Did you see like a great big ball? Like it was the singularity? Then you were part of it? In your mind, how that is made is the electrons. Now it can go anywhere for a period of time, and it's not a short period of time like the flash, it's a longer period, they can go back up the neuron. And guess what? If you trace all the paths through your little monkey brain, as Terence McKenna called it, the most densely ramified matter in the cosmos, right? <laughs> uh, the electrons now can go back and forth. They have the potential to go anywhere in the brain. Guess what? The number of pathways through your brain from A to B to C to D to F, you know what the number is? Anyone have a guess how big that number is, those number of pathways? Guess, guess big. Bigger. What's the biggest number in the universe other than like a Google or something that's artificial? What's the biggest possible number in, huh? Infinity is sort of an, the un, really unreachable. It's, a, it's too abstract. If you lined up every single dust grain on the playa, took it apart and found every single molecule atom down to the little subatomic things and even further down and counted them all up, but then you decided to count them for all the playas and all the alien Burning Man planets that are having Burning Mans this week, and you decided to count them for all the stars and, and you know the drops of alien beer and booze and cigarette ash and... But then you said, well, hell, I'll just count everything. It's just too hard to sort this out. I'll count all the particles in the entire universe. It's still a smaller number than your little monkey brain turned on. It's a much smaller number. Your brain is bigger than all that. It's so much bigger than all that 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 number, it, it occupies a little corner in your little monkey brain. So what is your monkey brain doing when it's in this state? It's an antenna and it's a transmitter. So what is Bell's non-locality? 
What is the idea that we've now proven, science has proven, that things affect the other things at a distance? And everything actually affects everything else in the universe at a distance. You know what this means? Put two and two together. You know where I'm going with this? Terence would have loved this rap. Terence called this the transcendental object at the end of time. Well, that transcendental object is you. It's you as a fully turned on transmitter receiver. Because when your brain is in that state and all pathways are possible, quantum dynamically, all those resonances are working for that period of time. Your brain is going ba-doom, 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 ba-doom. And the, the signal is so complex that it, it can touch every particle in the universe. The transmitter is bigger than the universe anyway. It's got spare informational capacity, so it's going ba-doom, 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 and all the other particles are going, something's going on on some planet in some galaxy, and we're just getting a little wiggle here. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. So what they do is all the particles, all the dust grains of the alien Burning Man, which is going on in Zebel Ganubi this week, those dust grains are vibrating. Your brain is vibrating their dust grains. Some aliens turned on their its brain is vibrating, all the dust grains here, but it's also vibrating in your brain and all the particles. So Mr. Universe, who's been asleep for a long time, no, a really long time, Mr. Universe is getting tweaked. He's getting resonated. He's getting, you know, boom, 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 more and more. What's happening in humanity? Humanity is rolling up the curve. Who did the boom boom thing in 2000 BC? Not too many. You know, we had some guy called Jesus who probably was into boom boom. You had mystics, you had ascetics, you had, you know, probably uh, Joan of Arc. She probably did the boom boom thing. She saw the face of God. But it wasn't that many people. And guess what? There's a lot of people doing it now. Lots and lots of us. Does this have an effect on the universe? It's very subtle, but your little monkey brain can rattle every particle in the universe when it's fully turned on. So coming back to the personal experience, therefore, when you see the face of God, when you are told by the onrushing thing that's about to dissolve you, that, kid, just fucking pay attention. This is everything. This is the totality. Like, get over yourself. And it comes crashing into you, and you dissolve, and it's called a non-dual state and you're suddenly a universe. And you can't really remember it because nothing can language it. This is another Terence thing. You can't English that one, right? Guess what? The thing that is in you is the universe. It is the universe. Because you're resonating with it, it's resonating with you. It's a single informational system. It's the whole fucking thing. So, face of God, Joan of Arc seeing it, revelations in the desert, turned on mind, ate too many of those prickly bush things in the Sinai, got turned on, you know, stoned apes in the East African veldt got turned on. Guess what they were doing? They were resonating the whole universe. They were the universe. Because their turned on brain, even probably one, two million years ago, was still big enough to connect with the whole universe. There's enough ramified matter there. So I don't know where I'm going with this. Oh, this is where I'm going. <laughs> you come back, and you want to make the greatest painting in the world. You want to do that. And you have that vision of becoming that painter. When you have that vision, and it becomes a flash, and you let that flash develop fully, and you let yourself have permission to say, I am going to do it. Oh my god, I can see this painting. It's even better and better and better and better. You're rattling the entire story. And the universe says, all right, there's another one. You know, punch up another IP request. Somebody just rattled the probability engine. I'm going to line up those stepping stones. One, two, three. And if that little monkey stays on course and decides, holy canoodles, there's a, someone going to supply me with painting. And there's Android Jones over there. He said, yeah, come in the studio. And I'll show you a few techniques. And like, oh my god, how could that ever have happened? Well, you had the flash. You had the totality. You rocked the universe. The universe is just a big probability server, and we just got a big request down the pipe. And it's providing you the things. Bink, 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 bink. So 
that works. It's worked for my whole life. I had dreams when I was in high school in the 70s about working with NASA. The dreams were so good that it resolved into actually working with NASA for 10 years. I designed the mission that the whole agency is planning to fly, taking humans to an asteroid. I designed that thing. Yeah. A month ago, they dusted me off, like I hadn't been down there in four years, pulled me back, I walk into the room and there's 42 people. They're all the big wigs. General Pete Warden, who's our fearless Darth Vader base commander at NASA Ames, and like all these friends from the old days that funded me for 25 projects. I sit down at the mission design table and I listen for about 45 minutes and realize there's been no progress made here in five years on thinking about how to do these asteroid missions. Their goal is really cool. Their goal was, can life live in the solar system on little bits of comet or asteroid? Can life actually live out there? We're made of life from the solar system. We're made out of those bits of comet. So can we take life out there and plunk it down and have it grow? Freeman Dyson talked about Dyson's trees somehow growing out on comets. But, you know, let's get real here. How, how difficult is this? And so for about a half an hour, the military ops guys were like, we got used upper centaur stages with extra fuel in them. We'll just turn them around and send them toward an asteroid. And I think, oh my God, that's such a dumb idea. Like, well, is there any actual mission with a grappling hook that can grab the asteroid and grind it up and put it in the bioreactor? And they're like, well, we only have a $2 million to $10 million budget. And they went on and on, and I almost left the meeting. I can't take it anymore. I just can't take it anymore. And I have nothing to lose. No one's funding me anymore. So I put my hand up, waited for the room to go quiet. I said, excuse me, excuse me, but if you look up in the night sky, you see streaks of light coming in all the time, streaks of light. Those are called asteroids. That's called the Perseid meteor shower. And there's a billion tons of that stuff coming in a year. If you wash your roof gutters off, put a drinking glass down, and the water goes in that glass, you'll find meteorites in there, lots of them. Like little balls, little grains of meteorites. And we have a perfectly good space station in orbit. It costs $100 billion. It has extra science bays outside. You can take the next astronaut or tourist in the Soyuz. You put the astronaut there, and you, at the last minute, you say, here, take this aerogel and shove it between your legs. You know, we don't fly the shuttle anymore, so we don't have a nice bus service. And this aerogel is practically lighter than air, almost material that they use to capture comet dust from comet tails, flying through comet tails. So we've done that. So you stuff it in between Yuri's legs and then give it to this guy. He goes outside, he packs it into the science bay outside, and it starts to collect virginal, pristine solar system material. And then you take it indoors in the space station, you pick it clean, and then you get a gram of it, and you find out if life can live there. And so what I'm saying is that was a flash in that meeting. I allowed that flash to happen. And not only that, but a whole spiral of missions, seven missions came into my head. Bang, 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 bang. All the way out to where you're bagging a comet with a Kevlar bag system. You're coming up to it. You wrap your bag around it. The comet is, is only like 15 or 20 feet across. You get your balloon around it. It is outgassing and it fills up, boom, like that. It just fills up and then you have your spigot on the end, and then you can steer the comet and you can move it anywhere in the solar system. And then some human craft or robotic craft can pull up to that balloon, stick its, you know, its camelback thing to it and fuel. Get water, get rocket fuel, all separated, all nice. You have fueling stations. Now you can open the solar system for humanity in one shot, just using cometary pieces. It's a fishing expedition. I, I blurted all that out, left the meeting, and they said, please write it up. I said, well, please put my name on it so I can get credit this time. And it's now gone to headquarters last week. So it's part of what's called an RFI. And if it's funded, well, not only the manic monkey will, for the first time, 
purposefully try to move life off the planet. But we'll find out a lot more. We'll find out how we can leave the planet. So this can happen from imaginative flashes. Does this all make sense? Let's turn now to the big one, which is what Andrew was getting at. And it's what a talk I did last year was about. It's the big one. How do we reimagine human civilization? The whole thing. So this preamble to this talk should give you permission that you can do this. You can do this fun exercise sitting right here now or in the comfort of your own homes or whatever. You dream the perfect world for you. You dream specific outcomes where things have been solved and dialed back and made softer and made more sustainable and more humane. If you can put that in your mind and you can dream into that, you will create the resonance that will start pulling us toward that. It's as simple as that. There's a man in the 60s that said, I have a dream, and he said, you know, black children and white children will be playing together in an open field in the sunshine. Martin Luther King. And guess what, it all happened. But in 1963, four, five, he's like, this is not possible, this is absurd. But what he did was he started out with that dream, I have a dream, black children and white children playing together. And it just manifested. Because people remember the I have a dream speech. So what if we do an I have a dream speech for human civilization? The key is here is no prescriptions, no methods, no mechanisms or ways to get to those things. Just purely dream the outcome first. As soon as you start thinking about, wow, uh, we can't solve agriculture until we do A and B and there's our evil people over here and et cetera, et cetera. Then you dilute it down the universe goes, that's too complicated, I can't even deliver on that one. And you can see this online, you can see utopian visions. I mean, there have been utopian visions in this country since about the Quakers. But I think this community is the only community on the planet that can do this I have a dream thing for the civilization. But it has to be total, because everything's connected to everything else. Currency, money is connected to power, which is connected to sociopathy and psychopathy within some of our brethren and our sisterin. Population is connected to resource and pressure and nature. The health of human beings is connected to early child rearing. It's a big, complex, interrelated thing. But I would warrant you, I would bet you, that in this dome here, right now, is a sufficient flash plus visioning brain power that can do the whole thing. We can do the whole thing. Does this make sense? Yes. <laughs> so do you want a question? So Android's question was, if each of us come up with our own flash, like I came up with in my podcast in Dr. Bruce's Levity Zone, the last four episodes have been imagining the world of 2050, 10 beautiful outcomes for that. And that's my gift to the community as a sort of starting point. I think if an individual does the research and they do the heart work and they do the mind work and they come up with that and they share that as a story, a pure thing, a pure story, a pure dream with others that will flash into them. And you share that dream, you share that story with somebody else, and share that story with else, it'll become the big ball. Big ball. Stuff will start relating. People will start filling in the blanks. Wow, that's a great addition to this dream. And then you get this collective. And guess what? It's even more powerful than a single brain getting turned on. So the universe goes, oh, there's a dome on this great desiccated part of the planet Earth, and in this dome I just received a huge request door. Then the universe is going, well, let's sort this out, let's see, they want to reinvent their civilization, and they have done this incredible community circle, they went into a cuddle puddle, they made eye contact, they danced their heads off, they looked at art, they got into the elevated state that was, you know, sufficient to do this work, and then they did the work, 
And then they did this collective and they stirred it and stirred it and stirred it and it went faster and faster and faster. And the universe said, I got it. It's a big one. It's a big pizza order, but I'll start. And then those people, because you bonded around this shared vision, this shared dream. I mean, this is how religious groups, all these persecuted people, they survived by the sheer love of the story that they were living and their dream of a promised land someplace. And they survived much more difficulty than we do, you know, in our lives. And they made it through and they built whole lands and they built cities and their temples were burned and then they moved on and they kept going and going and going. So we kind of have it easier, except our, our challenge is bigger because it's the whole planet. The temple is burning down on the planet. So we have to start imagining the new temple. You know, it might be something like Entheon. I mean, study that for a while. So putting all of your wonderful monkey minds to use and staying in contact, building that dream, loving each other in that space ball, having that dream, sharing it through media. But I, I would say to you, mostly it's voice and art. It's not like Facebook posts. I'm sure the universe looks at Facebook posts and goes, that is a whole lot of noise. It's just too many fragments. So I think it's people to people, recorded voice, story, passion in person, and then shared with the wider world. The great thing about the audio medium is you're in your jogging, or you're in a, some horrible commute, or you're in some boring like uh, network ops job, and that thing is bringing humanity life and hope into you. So you're a totally receptive being. So when you're out in the default world in a really awful condition, you turn to the voice. Krishnamurti, Terence McKenna, you know, us crazies and Dr. Bruce's Levity Zone and all these great podcasts and we hear time and time again the people that say I was in the wilderness as soon as I connect my patch cord to these voices I feel there's hope and I feel connected to a community that's why you know, I've got this thing on me trying to get a good recording so that this talk can be shared but all of your voices need to be shared so if this exercise ever happens and I think it will I think I see a lot of nodding head you know, you can do it with your own group. Record what you do and put it out there, put it into some kind of common pool so everybody can hear it and add to it. And one voice will emerge, one vision will emerge over time out of this great mashup of future civilization visions. And I think it will ignite it. It will ignite it. That simple thing will ignite the process. Let's do it! Let's do it! Yeah. Uh, so with that, um, I'm not sure what our time is, but uh, we have 23, minutes. 23 minutes. Let's get you involved. Let's uh, take some, I wouldn't say they're questions, your inspirations. And if we, we need to record this, I don't know how we're going to, you know, I'll just walk over like a preacher, you know. Okay. Hey, Bruce, uh, I did music for your podcast. Chris Adams. Hi. Dude, yeah, yeah, the first time we met. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. He did yeah. the most beautiful piece of piano. It's in, oh. Okay, so yeah, what, what you were saying earlier uh, it, it inspired me. I had this dream uh, about a month ago of, because um, I, I happen to live in LA and happen to have the friend resources that are in the, the film industry making commercials and they just are these amazingly talented people that can put on productions. And they do it, you know, for other people right now. Um, but I just saw this vision of all of our friends' talents and resources pooling into a single vision. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Bruce, and, hey, <laughs> and everyone else here, um, do you think that if everyone pulled together to create a vision, like imagine seeing the path towards the world that we want, like in a movie, or in film, like actually being like, oh, oh, I see it, that's all we'd have to do. Like it wouldn't have to be real, it would just be the actors, but then it would click. Maybe it'd be real, I don't know, yeah, you know? But like it, seeing it, monkey see, monkey do, we're all a bunch of monkeys here. <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, yeah. So this is how our brain works. We collect bit, bit of, bits of information, and then at some point there is an image there is a powerful entity, whatever image. And this is what Bruce was talking about, that we all together, with our vision of the world, at some point, will create entity through Gestalt, 
like cosmic gestalt, universal gestalt. Beautiful. That was beautiful, the gestalt. That brings in a huge tradition, actually. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to add to what you said about the um, sending the messages out into the universe. And I think you're, you're right that there's a hierarchy of signals. Uh, one of the most powerful be movies because they're kind of dream delivery technologies and they're collective. And if you create a complex new vision of the future, like the Dune novels or Star Wars, where people feel they can inhabit that future zone, that is an, and it's a story because we can live in stories, they're equipment for living, that's an especially powerful thing. But I think what I, what's missing from that also is the sense that it, the universe is already propelling those visions out of us. And what it's propelling them from is what Jung called the archetypes, these great primordial images. And I've written a book about these, what I call the singularity archetype. And um, there is an, a very active emergent archetype about this future evolution that is also propelling these uh, new ideas. And as Paracelsus, the great alchemist, said, we're here to finish nature. So we, as much as it's important that we pull the, push those images out there, they are also being propelled from within us by the universe itself. Wow. What's the name of the book again? Crossing the Event Horizon, The Human Metamorphosis. This is great source material for this work. Thank you. Hi, thank you. That was pretty cosmic and pretty, pretty far out, really. Uh, two things. You talk about the spoken word, and I want to add the written word, because there's, there's books like Aldous Huxley, The Island, that create utopias. That I, I think we live in a fast food society, and, and we need to put the effort, and we need to read these this amazing pieces that actually again, co-create a collective vision. The second thing that came up for me from your talk is you talked about these religious groups that um, sort of, you know, created this, these visions. And one thing that's very different about this community, th these religious sort of setups uh, were based on separateness. And I think what our community is called to do is to work on unity and actually be able to ex extend beyond this um, if we are to reach far and high. Thank you very much. Beautifully said. And in fact, the playa, I've been coming here since 1999. I am gobsmacked. Walking out on Tuesday night, oh my God. I mean, all of us in camp said, has the man burned? Because the energy level is post-burn. We used to only be able to sustain that for like, four or five hours after the man like tumbled down and everything. It's happening every single night here. It's at that level. We've reached a new peak. We are at a new level here. And so maybe when you're out on the playa tonight and you feel that energy and it's like the DJs have got the music all right. I mean, it's playing as one symphony. The art cars have got it right. The artists have got it right. Everything's got, we've gotten it right. And I was walking out there with my, my friend, and, and I said, how can this be happening in America? You know, like, how can, in an America of, you know, cubicles and shopping malls, and she said, I don't know what country you're from. This is my America. Yeah. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, a trillion dollars of wealth in Silicon Valley is powering this sucker, right? Everything else is pedantic. Everything else is serving burgers and fries compared to the power of this. Over there, there's a pyramid thing and there's a round thing. And there's another thing. The, the DJs are like a thousand feet up, you know, and, and there's people waving and, and the screens are 60 feet high, you know, like here. And I stood in there and I'm like, oh my God, the power of this. And I said, has humanity ever done anything like this? And my friend said, yeah, one other time. And it was in the Mayan civilization. It was on the face of a pyramid with steps going up very steep. And they were basically, there was blood flowing down. And they were sacrificing 8,000 people. And there were priests and everything. That was powerful, but that was dark power. And that dark power destroyed their civilization. Our Mayan temple, that's light power. So, and you know, we think nothing's happening, you know, there's no change year by year. Hey guys, the power of these artworks, the power of this music, 
the power of the entheogen movement, the power of the art, the power of voice, the internet, it's happening really fast. You know, on human scales, this thing is a flash. So Burning Man itself is a flash. You know, and you're in that flash. And that tail, the long tail that's coming out of Burning Man, every time we go higher here and the flash is more powerful, like this year is just, whoa, flash after flash after flash. It's turned on all of you monkey brains and there's this long tail and the tail's getting longer and longer. It's getting so long, you don't quite go down to baseline before it's time to come back to the burn or before it's time to go to your other festivals or it's time to make your startup. You're now this far off your baseline. Next year, you're gonna be this far off your baseline. And if you've gotten involved in a project like envisioning the future of civilization, you're even this far off your baseline because now you're connected with other people who are having the flash too. So we're lifting ourselves, we're levitating ourselves off that horrible baseline that commercialism, reductionism, and technology has forced everybody else down to. And we are now flying above them. It's like, hi, hi. <laughs> And now we're back to our little festival to recharge, or we're back to our group, our integration group, we're back to our art, and we still have altitude because we don't want to touch down to that earth. We're creating a new earth. That old earth's gonna fall away. And everybody who sees us flying through the sky is gonna be like, how do we get up there? How do we get some of that? You know, sign up for our airline, you know, buy our buy a ticket for our flights. What's that? Buy the ticket, take the ride. Ticket to ride. So in my barn, I have Timothy Leary's library now, and this vast collection, Android's seen, Andrew's seen it, and there's tubs and tubs and tubs of news articles from 1960 on up, from Harvard Crimson and that stuff on up, and it was an explosion. I mean, by 1967, there's like five tubs of clippings from every town in America where LSD and drugs and counterculture had exploded onto the scene. It was bigger than this, but it was just chaotic. It was just you know, the law enforcement community, the previous generations, nobody knew how to deal with it. So it's dealt with in, in total uh, gut-wrenching, violent way. It was an impact to the body. So this movement went underground and it went to its baseline. It hid behind, you know, suburban picket fences and Wall Street jobs and whatnot. And then now it's surged back. It is surging back. And it's got people like the Google founders. It's got people who are major dude scientists. It's got a cross section. It's got like the maps people. It's got l litigators. Litigators are your friends. Lawyers can change the world. So we've got lawyers on our side. We've got all this is happening and it's a totally new story. And it's our victory to lose at this point. A question? Or they're not questions, they're inputs. Yeah, I didn't really have so much as a question as a thought or idea. And uh, it's basically is every year this happens, we put so much time and energy and uh, resources into this. And, uh, you know, what if we, maybe not here, but went somewhere and did all this. And then at the end of it, we said, we're not leaving. We're going to stay and create a new society because I feel like that's, what we're here, that's what we're about, is creating a new, a new society, and we're kind of all sick and tired of the bullshit that we see that's going on. We're like, fuck this, you know? And uh, <clears throat> so what would happen if, if we did that? Um, you know, all the time and energy that we spend just to burn it all down, I mean, that's not unbeautiful, but um, yeah. This is a very good idea because did you know that one third of college graduates in this country can't get employment at all? One third are in crap jobs, and one third are like forced into the corporate ladder, you know, doing something. You know what that means? There's this enormous potential of people that's like an army, it's like an entire world, millions of people, high energy young people that are willing to throw themselves at this thing. It's a huge asset. It's an absolutely freaking huge asset. It can, it, it's enough to tip the balance. So what I might suggest before we start living there, let's start dreaming there. If there's anyone in this room who's a good event planner, and there probably are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them, people who have domes like this, uh, if you want to put on 
something somewhere in a beautiful space in an elevated space for an elevated state I would just love to come to it sorry Africa burn where's Africa burn it's in the oh my gosh it's in like the, the Western Cape or oh that's a beautiful country oh my god why don't we say here and now that this was module one where this was started right here at fractal planet but vision that this is going on at your events south africa and australia great poles you can hit all the continents and i'll put all my life energy into it believe me and i can put a lot of my friends that have ideas too and you guys can too consider that's an offer that we can do this again at these events because it's not just burning man it's you know it's your events hi what's your name Palace, and you work at the Zendo? Oh, wonderful. The Zendo is a wonderful thing. Thank you. I am honored to be part of it and part of this, and I want to begin by thanking uh, you I, and to acknowledge that um, I have always loved our space program, and it was part of what kept me sane as a child that that level of imagination was going on in the world and operating. So thank you for everything that you contributed to making that happen. Um, and four things, and I may forget them, and, I, and if I'm too long, you can stop me, because I look forward to the other conversations that happen. First and most important thing is you invoked Martin Luther King Jr. And so I, just because of my great love of him and the tradition that he came out of, I feel uh, compelled to uh, acknowledge, as I'm sure many of you are aware, and acknowledge that yesterday was the actual 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. And and a couple things about that. I think most a lot of people who um, loved him and loved that tradition and but most particularly loved the um, love of life and humanity that was making itself known in in him and through his work uh, would hope and pray that the speech that he would actually be most remembered for is one that occurred uh, five years later at Riverside Church in New York City and it was called Beyond Vietnam and many people who love him and have followed his work believe that it was making that speech that resulted in the fact that he was killed a year to the day later uh, for the things that he said, the truth that he spoke to power. So um, just to acknowledge that and to, and to make the connection that this ability that we have to connect and, and, and channel and resonate with ineffable and I would also say for me, that isn't unique to us as primates or I could, because I, in my experience, I have, there's been the, the Buddha whale, you know, even the, the so, but the, the, but the way that we do it, I think has unique and blessed aspects. And, and, and it's certainly our job as human beings to honor them because we are the ones who it is. Um, so, I think that's really all. I, w I just want to say thank you, and I want to encourage both the what you're saying, the the, the plugging in, and the and the and the resonance, and the channeling, and the allowing that to become the basis for our embodiment, both as you know individuals and as community, and our ability to channel it together, and what can happen is awesome. And and we need to remember that human beings have been coming together and channeling from the beginning, and creating bigger and more so let's keep it up thank you and I want to close I want to close with another plug uh, tomorrow at three o'clock uh, three to four at Palenque Norte which is the sort of sister we have a tea house there and everything it's at 9 15 and B I'm doing a talk which is another flash delivered vision which as I read this article it showed the Blombos cave in South Africa and it showed that they found shellfish and tools and a whole bunch of stuff that's about 160, 180,000 years old. It's a huge shocker. They're clearly the first modern humans. This is a major discovery. 
And at that time, Africa was like really dried out and very severe. And now there's the thinking that maybe that was the small group of what became us were in the genetic neck. And there was a very small group of survivors of what became us. And then I read another article about mitochondrial Eve, the common mother of human beings. We have one mother. We came from one woman. So the flash then came, what if she lived in Blombos Cave in South Africa? What if she was born there on a diet of shellfish? in a peaceable fishing community with the waves, with the males going off and collecting berries and dragging stuff up from the shore, very peaceable, and she was born, and the women saw this girl, and they said, we're forming a protective wall around here, she's so damn special, we love her. And she grew up, and she was mitochondrial Eve, and her genes would go on to conquer the planet. How strong was it? No one else survived. She was more powerful than every other hominid line. Neanderthals were doomed when she sat up. They were doomed because that gene walked north. It walked all through Africa and it conquered the world. In about 30,000 years, it had conquered the world. And so what happened in the Blombos cave when she was there? It would have changed the dynamic with the women. It would have changed the dynamic with the males. They would have gone, oh my God. And I'll tell you the, the story of what I think happened. And it led to the male bloodlust. It led to the separation of male and female, the idea of patriarchy and matriarchy. It led to 200,000 years of the stuff we've been through. But I believe mitochondrial Eve is on her return. She is on her return. And it's gonna happen in this century. And that's another story we need to put in ourselves. It's actually as powerful as visioning a human civilization because it is how we're going to vision human civilization. It's the return of mitochondrial Eve. So come by tomorrow at three to four over the playa here and contribute to that story too. Uh, so with that, levityzone.com, this will be there. Your voices will be there. Find all the voice of this growing thing there and I hope you, you can join in. Add your music, add your art. Thank you very much. Thanks Chris Adams for contributing more music to the Levity Zone. His piano composition, Improvisation of a Horse Running Through a Green Meadow, is heard in our intro and next in our outro. As you also might have heard in the Q&A, Chris was there in person in the audience at Fractal Planet, and it was the first time I had actually met this amazing whirling dervish of creativity. Thanks also to Andrew O'Keefe and to Steve Murtaugh for running the board and background tracks, producing the best ever recording I have had in a decade of speaking at Burning Man. We need more pros like these guys capturing way out talks in the festival scene. In other news, Levity's own webmaster Jacob Amon and myself have started physical. That's in person, folks. Levity Zone salons here and in various locations in the Santa Cruz area. We are recording these salons and we hope to feature some of these conversations in future podcasts. The energy of a group in conversation is unmatched in the medium of the voice and it is probably the most verdant format for true new ideas throughout history. Start your own physical salon in the style of the Levity Zone and contribute your spirited conversations to the online zone. Get in touch with us at www.levityzone.com. That's all from Dr. Bruce. See you next time as we wheel on to the next destination somewhere deep in Black Rock City.